All right, Ryan. So thank you for joining us on It's Real with Jordan and Demi. I'm Jordan Edwards. This is Demi Ramos in New York. And today we've got Ryan from Yellow Card. The band is back together. Um, so Apparently so. Yes, yes. I mean, you've been, you've been touring and you released an EP. So I, I would say that's pretty close to back together. Um, yes. Yes. So um, before we get into all the all the uh, the whole band stuff, let's talk about the new music. Um, you put this EP out. It's not typical for Yellow Card to put EPs out. Traditionally, mm -hmm. you're 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 an album based band. So mm -hmm. is this just something you got wanted to put together that you could do a little more quickly than an album? I mean, wh where did the EP come from? Um, we had no plans to record any new music. In, in general, uh, when this whole thing began uh, last year with committing to play Riot Fest being in Chicago was the first thing we'd done in over six years together. Um, and that was very much just like putting your toes in the water to see what, what the vibe was going to be. And so it wasn't until after the show that we started working on the tour this summer that just happened. And, and as that evolved, the conversation of making new music came up more and more. Uh, but we all live in different cities. Um, Sean Mackin, um, our violinist, uh, has two kids and at the time still had a full time job. He went into working like career man job right after the band split in 2016, 17. So he had a full time job. His wife was uh, coming out on the other side of some pretty intense cancer treatment. He had a lot going on in his personal life. Um, so the idea of, of taking on a full album, you know, uh, like two, three weeks of pre-production and four, five, six weeks of recording. It was just, uh, it seemed a little, a little much for what, what we could realistically pull off. So, um, tossed around the idea of doing an EP and in today's climate, does it matter anymore? Do you need an yeah. album? Yeah. You know, yeah. um, it's, I think we may stay with, if we keep making music, we don't have any plans to make any new music as of today, but I think if we keep recording, we probably will live in this EP format because um, it, it's so much less time consuming. It's so much more focused. You know, uh, I think as songwriters, you can really say, okay, what are we missing here? And there's no filler. Um, and I just think people's attention span by no fault of their own. It, it's, you make an album because you want someone to sit and listen to your album and you're going to have fans that do that certainly. But I think generally you're listening to music on your phone. You know, I mean, we, we mix test songs on the phone speakers now because yeah, it's like, yeah. well, if it doesn't, it doesn't sound good on this. Pe people literally listen to music just with their phone, no headphones, nothing, you know? So you're on your phone, but then your, your wife texts you, your mom texts you, your, your, you know, whoever, and then you're out, you, you leave the app, you're not listening anymore. And then do you go back and finish the album if you're, call it a, a casual listener of, of music and bands and artists, you know, and uh, I, I, so I, I think the EP format is great because um, you really can hone the songs, at, you know, whittle it down to exactly the best of the best um, that, that you have to offer at that time, um, where, wherever you're at creatively. And then the chances of someone just listening to five songs, it's honestly, it's just greater than people listening to 10 songs, you know? Well, you definitely, I'm going to switch Demi out here real quick. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, I mean, it definitely is, you know, there is no filler on this. I was, I really love the song you did with Dashboard. Um, first of all, how handsome is Chris Carabin in real life? As, as handsome as you could possibly dream. That's, it's that's just really, you know. Level 10. <laughs> I mean, that dude's an 11. He's, oh, shit. That hairline, oh, that hairline is just not fair. Yeah, it's, it's he's kind of got that eternally, like, it just keeps getting better even as he gets older. It's like an, a, a fine wine situation. But For sure. Yeah, so you're putting together, you have a song with Pierce the Veil as well. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you end up with two collaborations on a, on a five-song EP? Um, we talked about the idea of having guest vocals, which we haven't done a lot of in our career. We have a few songs um, out of, I don't even, I don't know how many songs we actually have out in the world, but you know, we didn't have a lot of guest features. We didn't co-write songs with people, um, but we felt like if we were going to do new music uh, that we, we wanted to 
reach as many people as we could with this music because we really did, I think, return in a way to like the core sort of sound that people know and love from Yellow Card. We, our last two full length albums were very much uh, personal journeys for us. And we stepped way outside of the box of what people I think want to hear from from the band. We really kind of made records for ourselves and less uh, less for you, you know, mm -hmm. on the last couple. And with this EP, it was really important for us to make music that would get people excited about the band again and, and you know, make people want to come back to the band and um, and fall in love with that that sound that I think they originally fell in love with 20 years ago. But how do you how do you do that without sounding forced, without sounding like you're 43 chasing 23? It's it's pretty, it's challenging for sure. Um, but and I'll get to the guest guest vocals. But for me, honestly, I, I don't I think it felt um, it ended up not feeling like, you know, it was forced or we were like faking it to kind of capture this moment in time from the past. Because for me personally, uh, I hadn't written any kind of pop punk or, or rock music in so many years mm -hmm. uh, that it was like a true challenge to put that hat back on and get back into the headspace of writing yellow card songs. And and so it was less about how do we make this for example, sound like Ocean Avenue. And it was more like, how do I capture the energy, uh, you know, and the vibe um, that that comes to mind when I just, when I think about Yellow Card, right? Like, and, and, and so just sitting down and picking up a guitar and riffing uh, with the guys, like it just naturally came out that way. And we were, we were on a mission though, to get people excited. We want people who haven't listened to the band in 20 years to, to find this music and say, wow, that's, that's yellow card. They still sound like yellow card, you know? Um, but the guest vocals were really just to help ex to get some exposure for the music. We've been gone for a long time, you know, and, and our, the, the listeners really trailed off with the music we were making in the late 2010s before we decided, or mid 2010s, I guess, before we split up, mm -hmm. um, we had really lost, I think a lot of casual listeners. Um, and so we really wanted to get people excited, ignite the fan base, you know. And so uh, Vic was, they both happened very organically. I was literally just texting Vic to tell him how rad I thought the new Pierce the Veil record was. And that text conversation evolved into, would you want to maybe sing on one of our new songs? Um, sent him the demos and he loved Three Minutes More and wanted to sing on that song. And there it is. Uh, Chris and I have gotten a lot closer over the last decade or so because we both lived in Tennessee, um, in Nashville. And when the, when the band broke up, he was just such a good friend and, and just a, an incredible resource for advice and direction when I was trying to kind of go it alone, you know, and, and do it without yellow card, make music and, and continue to be successful in music without yellow card. Uh, Chris was just like all, always there with advice and help and, and direction. So I had the song that he sings on, which is called The Places Will Go. The vocals on that song from me it were recorded in 2015, and those were still the vocals you're hearing on the record. I had that song oh, wow. just laying around, never got used. Yeah. Um, so I, re I sent the demo to Chris, just thinking this acoustic track is going to be perfect for us to collab on. Um, and he was really excited about the song. And, and I said, I didn't give him any direction or anything. I just said, take it and do what you want with it, you know? So. Isn't it um, so cool? Like, I just like something came to mind. So like a lot of rock artists, rock bands, just in general, right? They're kind of, there's a lot of collabs happening. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's because of like the streaming age, but how cool is that? That like, you know, you see all of these like collaborations coming from rock artists. I think it's more than it has ever been before. And I, I do think it it's totally, uh, you, you can, you can like, I think you can infer that it's all happening because of social media and streaming. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the way, the way artists connect, like I, I don't, I don't really listen to, um, much rock and roll at all. And, and really? what are you kind, of ran to? kind of random that I actually, that I texted Vic because I, I saw that they had put out the, a new record and I, I'll be curious, you know, my, my friends put out a new record or, or, you know, the Foos put a new song out. I'll listen to it, but it's not my regular daily listening. So then what um, are you listening to? I listen, I listen to like a lot of really, obs not obscure because these guys have like two, three million listeners. You know, the, the bigger guys in the, in the genre have a few million listeners a month, but um, I'm really into like kind of this ambient underground electronic music, this movement of sort of like um, not clubby, not not like top 40 That's dance cute. music, but like more kind of 
I, I don't know, more. Have you ever heard of Alix? I just discovered this last night. It sounds like mm -hmm. exactly what you're saying. Uh, it probably is. I haven't heard of them, I'm, uh, but I'm I'm really wow. into um I'm really into uh, this German uh, producer named Christian Loeffler. He's one of my favorite artists in the world, and oh, we yeah. have, Jimmy loves like just... lo-fi German. Electronic yeah, yeah. So stuff. so it's like it's not lo-fi what I'm listening to, but it definitely lives in the same headspace as lo-fi. It's it's like it's dance music. But it it's wow. got a lot of organic elements, and it it never it it doesn't you know there's it's not like fog blasting dance music at 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 Burning Man. It's like <laughs> it's like it's like sunset vibe out set music, you know. And I so mm -hmm. I've I just I'm really into um, instrumental music in general. I, I if I do listen to like rock music, I'm listening to post rocks like Explosions in the Sky and. Um, and Godspeed You Black Emperor and some of it, like it's the, the, I don't know what it is about lyrics, but I'm just kind of over it. <laughs> I just don't know why. Um, but anyway, so this is just to, to talk to the collabs. I, you know, Christian Loeffler, who has been like my number one most played artist at my like Spotify wrapped every year for the last, I don't know, four or five years, we connected via social media and we've become friends. I've seen him play in a couple of different cities and, and we text all the time. And, and, you know, I, like we're talking about maybe working on something together. It's like, worlds colliding as far as you know working with an artist like that being from my background so um it's it i think the whole collab culture collaboration culture is super cool and and super organic it, for for as much as i am a mm -hmm. outspoken critic of social media it does have its benefits and i think artists collaborating is one of them have you um interacted much with younger artists um we had mxpx on the show last week and we were talking about uh, John Feldman from um, Goldfinger and how he's produced a lot of younger artists and toured with younger artists. Have you mm -hmm. had younger artists reach out to you? Have you done much with, with people? I thought when the band broke up in 2016, 17, that I was going to get into producing. That That's where I really thought my path was going to take me. Um, and I did a couple of things and I realized that it just, it wasn't really what where my heart was at. You know, it wasn't what I was passionate about. Um, but that said, yeah, I've worked with I've worked with some some younger artists. I, I got to go one of the coolest experiences I've ever had in my career. I got to go to Japan for like nine weeks and make a record for a young band in Osaka. Um, oh, cool. And so I, I was just living in like a super residential neighborhood wow. in Osaka. I had to totally make my own way, no, like in in like the more touristy areas, like in, in you know in Tokyo or in at even in the more central areas of Osaka, people will speak enough English to get by or whatever. But I was in a, I was in a neighborhood where it was just like, you, you know, it was everyday working class Japanese people lived in this neighborhood and no one spoke a word of English. And I just had, I was there for two months and I had to just sort of sort of forge my way for food and groceries and everything. It was, it was wow. so exciting and so fun. And, and, but every, you know, I'm walking down the river under, I was there in March too. So I'm there like in the middle of Sakura, like a uh, cherry blossom season. And I'm walking to work every day at the studio, taking the train. It was, it was awesome, man. Um, so that was, that was a really positive experience, but I think in general, spending two months producing an album for, for an artist, I think I just wasn't really scratching my creative itch that way. You know right. what I mean? Um, and I sort of immediately pivoted back into making my own music, but, um, but you know, we also know that the band has, has been really influential for for a lot of younger artists, and and it's yeah, really yeah. Well, always cool to hear about, that. What do you make of this whole pop punk resurgence? How everyone loves power chords and emotional lyrics, and you know, jumping around on stage again. And, and I, for those nineteen year olds, I don't understand, man. Uh, mm. It's really. I mean, we just did the biggest tour of our entire career. I mean, uh, like we we had a song, you know in the top 10 and top 40 radio in 2004. And these shows were twice as big as those shows. I mean, it was, it was the most surreal experience. The summer was the most surreal experience uh, of my career. I, I, none of us understand what is in the water, what's happening or, or why or how. Um, well, you have two generations. You have the people who are 19 who are loving it for the first time. Then you have people who are 40. Who yeah. Are the, yes, the, the, there, there is that, but I mean, still to like put it in perspective for you, one of the best markets on the tour that we were just sort of like, how is this even possible was the Detroit Michigan show. We normally, with the exception of um, the, the fine, the very, what was the final tour that we, we truly thought was the last time we were ever going to tour in 2016, we played a bigger venue in Detroit, probably like a 2000, I think the Fillmore, it's like 2000 capacity. Um, and that show did well, but normally like from 2010 till 16, we would play at St. Andrews hall in Detroit, it holds 900 people. And 
it, you know, I think it would usually sell out, but it was like day of, week of. It was like kind of right at the end. Right. We, we sold almost 7,000 tickets in Detroit this summer. So, yes, there's two generations, but seven times the amount of people. Yeah. How do you yeah, explain yeah. that? How do you explain it? Wow. I don't know. I don't know. And that happened in most places. I, th the, I think the average ticket, like if you took all 30 shows and, and, and the bottom line average per show was somewhere around 4,900 tickets. That's, that is wild, dude. That is wild. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. biggest shows we, we play, you know, headline shows we play were House of Blues, like 2,500 people. That's the biggest thing we've ever done. Right. So, you, you know, your average is doubling that. And we don't really have an explanation. We're not looking for one, though. I don't need an No one needs to explain no. it to me. I just want it to keep happening. <laughs> I think, too, like, music is, like, so intertwined with culture, intertwined with, like, just, like, everyday life because people are on their phones and they have access to, like, so much stuff. So they're, like, exposed to so much more so hey i mean yeah we're not we're not wondering why that's a good thing well i think that i think that there is the generational thing where people are bringing their kids and they're bringing you know mm -hmm. people who get that or, or people who are too young to see us play even even 10 years ago uh are, are coming to these shows but it, it's still it's still just overwhelming to see i mean we, we're you know we're playing amphitheaters we've never done that before we're, we're we had you know video walls and semi trucks and just mm -hmm. A totally different experience for as an artist that we we've, we've never had. Uh, you know, we got close to it 20 years ago. We did. We really we were we could almost touch the sun. You know, back then, and and then we just sort of started to to fall away from it. And yeah, you know, that led to the in inevitable sort of demise of the band that we felt was so permanent. But mm -hmm. I mean, we should have sounded more like Daughtry in 2005. <laughs> we had more hits. No, I'm just I'm just I'm just no. Um, What's your favorite band like tour memory? Um, big question. Yeah, it's tough. It's really tough. It's like when you, cause you do answer that question with like my favorite place I've ever been in the world, my one favorite show, my, you know, yeah. uh, it's tough to call one favorite tour, but I mean, I will say that one of the most monumental and, you know, an experience that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. Uh, we opened for Lincoln park in Japan in 2007. And so, you know, we're playing and it was, we were direct support. So it was just, there was like a Japanese band One, that two. opened and then we played and then Lincoln park played. And, uh, so we did, you know, two nights at the super arena in Tokyo. It's like 30, 20,000 people a night. And we're, and then, and then we finished the show and we get to go out and sit and, in, in, you know, really good seats and watch Lincoln Park play every night. It was, uh, and, and then connecting with that band and being a part of their, their story. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I was a part of the, the, um, the Memorial, uh, show that they did for, for Chester in 2017, you know, that just ha ha being a part of the Lincoln Park story is, is something that I will cherish for forever. What was he like? I, I mean, everyone knows him as this, like, you know, I mean, his fans probably just seem to this like godlike figure, just so talented. But like, how does he scream like that? How does he like have mm -hmm. this kind of like energy, presence, whatever? Like, what is something that you can say having known him personally about him? It, it's so uh, tough to talk about and like get your head around the fact that he's gone and the reasons that he's gone because he just radiated positive energy anytime you were around him he was like beaming smiles and you, you when you played music with him you know i got i got to play with lincoln park uh also in 2014 i think i i did a, a song with them at warp tour in ventura california and the, it's it's real like they they love what they they do it is not a job for them but and and chester is just he was so intense as a performer um but so not in intimidating in any way when you meet him and speak to him and you know i was terrified that day in ventura i was terrified to get up there and sing with them and he was just so calming and, and kind and like reassuring you know that like we got you dude you're with us it's totally fine and 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 it was it was amazing it was, it was such a good day and such a good performance and um so we weren't friends in the way that, you know, we didn't keep up and text and hang out outside of music really, but there were a, a few very impactful moments in my life that directly involved my time with them and, and, and with Chester. And he was just something to aspire to as an artist. I mean, the guy just carried around positive energy everywhere he went. And when you're operating at that level, 
you know, I never made it anywhere close to that level, but I let even just the level we got to in the early 2000s, I, I let that shit get to me and, and really, really tear me down and, and, and turn me into a bit of a negative person. And so the fact that Chester was able to navigate, you know, now we know so much of what he was dealing with behind closed doors, but also just the pressure and anxiety that comes with a career at that, of that size. Um, it's, it's remarkable. And he was like, I mean, he was a really inspiring person. So it's like that, that is a core memory for me, my time with them. You sound above all, you sound really appreciative of the time you've had singing and, and the, the chance you, you have now to, to do it again. Um, do you feel like you mentioned your native person? Do you feel like you're, I don't know whether you practice meditation or, or whatever, but you seem like you've kind of, you're more, you seem more in tune with everything. You seem Have you had calm. a spiritual awakening? Yeah. <laughs> um, we, uh, we meditated every day on, on tour. We had a, we had a, a wellness lounge backstage and, and we, the whole band would, uh, would, uh, would take about half hour, hour before the show. We meditated every day. Uh, so yes, I've been practicing it for about three or three, four years now. I, I, I had a really, really close friend from high school that I'm, you know, I've been friends with him for 30 years. Um, introduce the practice to me and show me some tools and resources to learn how to properly do it and, and uh, you know, learn the benefits of it uh, for myself. And it has changed my life without question. Um, I, my, my reactivity is at an all time low and, you know, my ability to sort of experience uh, difficult situations on the road or, you know, in my career and not and, and, and have that extra moment of, of calm and peace to let it let it pass through and, and approach it with with a different and better energy than I probably would have 20 years ago. That, that's a very real thing for me. Yeah. So with that being said, you know, you mentioned that this EP is kind of returned to the to the classic yellow card sound, whereas the 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 self titled album twenty sixteen was I so I love the twenty sixteen album. My, I both it, that those had, last like, two records are my favorite records we ever made. I love the meaty guitars. It's not yeah. metal, but it's like there's more density to it. Yeah. Um. um there's this. What's um, I'm sure I wrote it down. I really liked um, that song. What appears? That's on the second yeah. track. I think on the yep. on the last album. It's one of my all time favorites. Yeah. Lo love it. So what was it like going back in the studio with the guys again and trying to return to that 2000 sound was it what fit like a glove or was it a little bit difficult to kind of get back in that mode um i i can't speak for everyone i think for me it it didn't necessarily fit like a glove again but i'm lucky to be surrounded by the three other dudes in the band who are just the most talented human beings you could ever dream of working with. And I think their excitement and passion about rediscovering that sound, while it maybe took a minute, it was very infectious. And it, and it, it you know, I really, it finally clicked for me when I started demoing the vocals and getting serious about, about writing, because I think the one thing that, that, that takes it out of the early 2000s Ocean Avenue era sound um is is not ne not necessarily a sound thing but i think as a lyricist you know i was still very much planted in the in the present time um and where i am now that the one thing that i don't think i was even attempting to recreate was like content you know lyrical content the the, the ideas and themes that i wanted to talk about i very much stayed in the lane of lift to sail in the self-titled album i think as a lyricist uh but the music underneath what has was is kind of a return to that like high energy um you know super melodic uh experience that i think a core yellow card fan will is really excited to hear from us yeah it's, it's funny you say as i was listening to it that's what it felt like it felt like yellow card the band the sound was familiar but the lyrics were written by a much more mature person it wasn't the lyrics you write when you're 19 20 years old yeah the yeah. lyrics of, of a person born in the 70s <laughs> yeah 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 so but it, it, on on a personal on on the personal side what was it like you know interacting with the members of the band after you know mm -hmm. breaking up basically was was that difficult at all no um really grateful for for the guys and 
you know, their ability for 20 years now to, uh, you know, to understand me the best they can and to be so forgiving and, uh, you know, to allow me to continue to play the role I play in the band, even though I've, I've been an absolute nightmare to work with in earlier stages of my career. Um, I think, you know, it's a twofold thing of, of me making a conscious effort to improve uh, who, you know, who I am as, as a person and as a colleague and as a friend and their ability to give me the space and the time and to recognize that I'm doing the work made the experience just so good. It was so fun and positive and it felt, again, you can go into the room and try to chase who you were as a musician at 23 because that's the song that made, that that's the music that made you popular. Or you can just get together and pour some whiskeys and, you know, maybe reminisce a little bit. And what comes out naturally is that core sound. And that's exactly what happened. We, we, we had, there was no pressure for these songs. We didn't, you know, we're, is anyone even going to listen to them? It was all so new and, and fresh, like coming back to it. We didn't know that the tour was going to crush the way it crushed. We didn't know that the, the songs were going to, you know, get playlisted at the level that they have, or childhood eyes is even starting to pick up steam at, at, at commercial radio. We had, we had no expect expectations for any of that. So what it was really about was spending time together to, to your question. The whole experience was sort of designed to put us back together uh, from, you know, as far as rebuilding our relationships, because it was the end of the band, what, what was to be the end of the band in 2016, 17, that relationships were strained. It, it was, there, was a, there was a lot of tension and a lot of negative energy uh, behind closed doors. And that was one of the reasons we, we decided to step away from it on our own terms and try to make it something great for the fans when, when we ended it. Uh, so rebuilding and nurturing those relationships back to health was a big part of this writing and recording almost more at so than the music itself. I think. I think it's so punk rock of you to just be like, yeah, like I was a nightmare to work with. <laughs> I mean, so thank you for your honesty. Of course. I, I really try to be open about those things now because I have the, you know, I, I have the experience and I have the, the time that I've I've spent reflecting on the choices I've made and and the the failures I've had, and as as a person, uh, as a colleague, as a friend, and I think being able to talk about it in a way that might help someone else who is uh, coming into this career or this lifestyle, you know, um, to to give give just share some insight on the fact that when when you're young and and things are happening so fast and your dreams are coming true. You know, especially back then, I, I, I imagine it might be easier now because it is more uh, acceptable to talk about and there are more tools for people to use uh, to improve their mental health. But in 2003, 2004, we didn't No one was talking about mm -hmm. about that. No one was talking about anxiety and insecurity and, wow. and extreme hard. stress, the things that I, I really uh, did not deal with well and externalized and had this super high level of reactivity. If something upset me, it was you, you knew. Uh, and that can be really unpleasant to be around as a as a band member, as a crew person, as a partner, you know, in a relationship it can, it, when someone is, is is that on edge all the time. Uh, it can be really, it can be hard to work with. So I don't know that nightmare is the right word, but I, I know that I could be difficult at times because I had this uh, incredibly high level of reactivity uh, that that was just not the best version of myself. Now I know that all of that came from anxiety and insecurity and stress and not knowing how to have communication with the relationships I had in the band so that we could work through whatever difficulties we were having, whatever problem, you know, it, that's how it works now. Uh, if there's something we need to discuss, something that needs to be brought up, we, we start the conversation before it becomes a disagreement as opposed to letting it fester and just, you know, bottling it up until it explodes, which is very much how we operated for almost 20 years. So, um, yeah, I, it's, 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 le you know, I'm not trying to, um, trying to get like a pat on the back for it. I think it's, and I'm not saying that's what you're doing. I'm just saying that it's more about having, um, having, taking an interest in sharing my story because I think it could be helpful for other artists. To understand. Yeah. That's really bad. That's so cool. When you guys put together this, this tour that you just got off of, um, what was it like putting together the stage show itself, the logistics of like what song is going to go where, where are we going to put the new songs? Was there anxiety about the fan reaction to the new songs? How, what was it like prepping for this? 
Mm -hmm. It was it was challenging. Um, I think we all knew going into this that we want we wanted this set list to sort of do what we were trying to do with the EP as far as we wanted to captivate people. We wanted to get people excited. We wanted to remind people why they loved Yellow Card in the first place. And that is sort of goes hand in hand with making a set list that's basically just full of, for lack of a better word, singles, you know, songs that we promoted, songs that we made videos for. Ocean Avenue? Avenue. So, uh, yeah, that, that, one was, Avenue. that one was on there. Um, what was the number? Uh, I don't, we've only played like two shows since 2004 that we haven't closed with that show or with that song. Since you, um, you, it in. you wrote that song. Do I remember the moment? Yes. Um, I remember the sort of moment that the idea was formed. Um, wow. I had, I had the lyric written down, um, without any music to go with it. And then in rehearsal, cause that was, you know, nowadays we demo songs sitting around a computer, you know, we just plug guitar straight in and we program yeah. the drums on it, play them on a keyboard and we can make, move yeah. everything around and make it sound the way we want. Back then we had to set up in a, in a rehearsal space and play live to demo all the ideas, record them live. So you'd have to play them a hundred times a day. Um, and I remember when the rhythmic sort of concept for the verse of Ocean Avenue came to, to be in rehearsal. And I thought I have this lyric that is super rhythmic and probably will work over this, uh, over, over this pattern and, um, took the demo home and took those lyrics out and, but it, I don't know if you guys know the story or not, but Ocean Avenue almost did not go on the album. Um, I had the uh, I had the verse done, and in rehearsal before we went in the studio, the only thing I could hear in my head uh, over the chorus was I didn't know it until someone was like, "Dude, you can't you can't use that melody." It was um, "Time After Time" by Cindy Lauper. I had like a some version of that melody oh. over that chorus and they were like dude that's you can't do that we'll get in trouble you know kind of thing you can't use that melody so no. i really i, I really that. struggled to find a chorus melody for ocean avenue the song so we're now in the studio the whole song is recorded the verse vocals are recorded but the choruses are just sitting empty and we're kind of getting towards the end of the process and i still had not come up with anything that our producer uh neil avron who's made all of our records since ocean avenue um he, he just wasn't vibing with anything I was bringing in. I would come in every other day and say, what about this melody? And it was like, eh, whatever. So it was gonna, we weren't gonna finish it until some other time and it was gonna be a B-side um, on the album. And then one day I, I came in and I sang the, the chorus to him, uh, at least the beginning of it. And he was like, that's it, that's that's the chorus. Go in there and track that right now. Um, and I did, and there it is. Some, you know, it's the reason I have a job today. Yeah, now I'm going to listen. Now I'm going to go back and listen to what it would sound like, with like a time after time vocal melody as the chorus. That'd be that's such a strange. I analogy. think it was like, well, it's you know, it's the three chord like progression, and it was so at that repeating of da 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 da. That was just something yeah. like that, and I I didn't know where that was coming from in my head, and then so, I think Pete, our, our bassist at the time, was like, "That's that's a song already." It's we always someone in the band that would just be like, "That's a song. That's yep. not this song." I'm like, you, yeah, it's something you know you, you deal with quite a bit, actually. I mean, you have so much musical how many information in your head. Are there on the scale of music? How many what? Like, how many notes are there? There's only so many like musical tones well that's the thing we get into uh, we get into the conversation now of of like you know what 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 constitutes i think i think when it comes to chord progressions and, and i think melody is still something that you have to be conscious of and like is not acceptable to just be like well there's only so many notes in the scale you know so you can you can only do what you can do but i think chord yeah. progression wise what what, what are you going to do you there you, you chord progressions are 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 going to be repeated for eternity because there is literally only so many combinations of the, but with a vocal melody that I, I think the possibilities are still endless to create new, you know, new ideas. But uh, yeah, Ocean, uh, point of the story is Ocean Avenue was almost a B side and it's wild to me every time I tell that story. I went to University of Miami and I was really disappointed that the Ocean Avenue you were talking about wasn't the Ocean Avenue on South Beach. So I'm sorry, uh, it's actually yeah. Ocean. It's actually Ocean Boulevard here too. It's not even called Ocean Avenue, but I changed it oh, okay. to rhyme, so, so, changed yeah, it to so rhyme it. Yeah, well, it's a little artistic license, little artistic yes, license. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So before we let you go here, Ryan, um, tell us what's next for the band. What's next for you? What do you guys got coming up in the next six months or so? 
Uh, we are, the only other thing we're doing this year is uh, when we were young festival in Las Vegas, which we're really, really excited about. The lineup is, you know, stacked and all of my friends that played the festival last year, which was the first year of the festival. Th this is so, so when we were young, when it came out, the, when the news broke that there was going to be this festival in Las Vegas, and then we saw the lineup and like just how many bands and how many massive bands uh, were on it from our, you know, our world, our genre, whatever you want to call it. We sort of had this, I think a lot of people had this sort of like fire festival vibe of like, that's not, you can't pull that off. There's no right. way. Damn. Like, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And apparently uh, all of my friends who played it last year said it was like the best festival they've ever been a part of. Just the hospitality was incredible. The crowd was amazing. The, everything wow. went off without a hitch and the, you know, the schedule was perfect. And uh, so we're really looking forward to being a part of that this year. And then um, uh, we have something i can't tell you about yet uh a recording opportunity that i can't tell you about love a tease we love a tease um, and so it's it's quick it's a quick thing it's not an album or anything like that it's just kind of a one special thing we're gonna do uh so we're gonna work on that before the end of the year uh my my first kiddo is going to arrive in december my wife and i are expecting our first oh my god kid, so that's gonna be a pretty a boy, you know, or girl. A boy. um that's gonna is be you gonna play guitar I, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I don't play. I don't think I play enough guitar anymore for him to be to want. I, I'm all, I play keep. You know, I'm always on my keyboards now. Um, but uh, so that'll be pretty consuming, obviously. And then the only other thing we have like on the books is uh, the Emo's Not Dead cruise at the end of February, which I, I actually did that cruise last year uh, playing guitar for Newfound Glory. Um, and I played a few little acoustic sets of my own on the boat and it was so fun. So we're also really looking forward to we're headlining that the cruise. We're really looking forward to that. Cool. Cool. Amazing. All right, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Dude, thank you guys for having me. And, uh, you know, we're, we're everyone who's like bringing us in and supporting the band right now. It goes, goes farther than you think. So we're really grateful. All right. We'll talk to you later, Ryan. Thanks. All right. Cheers. Bye, Thanks guys. Bye. Take it easy. All right. No, thanks. See ya. <laughs> All right. I'm okay. I'm such a nerd. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. So that was Ryan key from yellow card. Um, the new, uh, EP, uh, I keep wanting to say, <laughs> I keep wanting to say ocean eyes, like the, like the, like the Billie Eilish song, uh, childhood eyes is out now and, uh, yeah, check it out. It's really good. All right, Timmy. That was really That's cool. I really enjoyed that. that yeah. Was, like he was super insightful. And just like, yeah. the honesty was really hitting me to be fair. The honesty. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, man. All right, guys, that'll be it for us. I'm out. Demi's out. As always, go to popdust.com for the latest in pop culture and music news. Follow me on Instagram, Jordan Edwards Studio. Follow Demi at Demi underscore Ramos. Until next time, we'll see you later.